Hello, everyone. Today we're going to continue our discussion on where we are observing the creation of the material universe and its etheric counterpart as seen in the cosmic consciousness, the so-called Akashic Records. In this episode, we will travel back across time and space to witness the creation of the three-dimensional universe, our planet Earth, and its corresponding etheric world. We will witness the development of Earth in detail across vast eons of time and disclose the nature of etheric energy and its vast field of potentiality the scientists are now calling zero-point energy. Now, all of creation is started by a divine vibration and is continued by a divine vibration called the pulse of life. This enlivens and maintains all forms of life. In the vegetable kingdom, it starts from the sap rising and the sap falling. It's all driven by this pulse of life, which comes from the Holy Spirit. And that is why we want to adjust our breathing to the rhythm of the pulse of life. The pulse causes our heart to beat. If it was up to us to make our own heart beat, we would all be dead a long time ago because we'd forget to do it. The Holy Spirit is taking care of us and has been taking care of us since we were a fetus in the womb of our mother. And it's the same thing with the physical body. It, too, has a radiant pulse of life. We're going to speak about where we are in this thing called reality. So let's start with the material plane. And by that, I mean the world of the three dimensions. Because that's a common part. We can all agree we're in the third dimension right now, can't we? We will describe this reality from bottom up. So we are starting with the material world. And by material world, I mean Earth, the planets, the moons, the suns, the solar systems, all the solar systems, and all the galaxies, and all the entire universe. That's what we call the material world. It's one plane in the third dimension. What I'm going to do is to try to use science, religion, and mysticism to paint a picture of how all this manifested in the third dimension. Mysticism, science, and religion all have their own way of describing how it all is. And it's very, very interesting. Each of them describes reality just about as well as the other one does. And they each give their followers the exact same thing, and that is certainty. Except science certainty changes about every year, so it's evolving. But both science, religion, and mysticism gives the people who follow them a perspective on reality. And they feel like, okay, I'm here in this locality. I get where I am. And this gives them a sense of certainty in time and space. Now, the difference with mysticism, it's not a theory like provided by scientists. It's not limited to the research in the third dimension like scientists do. To study this thing called reality mystically, you have to be able to experience the higher dimensions and go beyond just the third dimension, which is the lowest dimension in terms of vibration. Ultimately, the most reliable source of information on all this is the cosmic consciousness, the so-called Akashic Records. And what is this? You heard the word the etheric already, and you probably know that everything existing has its etheric counterpart. You can call it God's mind at its highest level, and at the lowest level, it's the etheric double of our planet and our material body. Now, one of the qualities of this mind is that it imprints and records everything. So everything that's happened on the planet, in the solar system, anywhere throughout the galaxies, is imprinted in this Akashic Records, this cosmic memory. It is so detailed. If you were able to go back in time a thousand years and see a conversation between two people, and one of them got bit by a mosquito, you would see every detail of the mosquito. It's a very, very exact thing. And for the mystic who can do this, they can enter into the cosmic consciousness, control it, roll back time, and see how the earth began, or anything, how any galaxy began, 
if they can reach that far. Now, mystics like Blavatsky talked about it, what she saw. Steiner spoke about it. Casey spoke about it. And they all give different dates for these unfolding events in the universe, the creation of the planet, events in past times on the planet. But how can that be if they're seeing a true permanent record of what took place? How can they give different dates? Well, when you're able to read the cosmic consciousness, it takes a great deal of steady concentration to rewind, as it were, these cosmic recordings. And when you do manage to roll back time, you start to seeing real past events. However, there is no calendar flipping pages over like in the movies. So there's no date when you witness these past events. The mystic viewing all this must infer the past time in history based on things he's seen and what he knows. That's why we have different dates given for the same events. So we're going to look at the creation of the material universe as seen by a mystic in the cosmic consciousness. And another thing about this consciousness, the records there is it's not like watching the records unfold two-dimensionally on a screen like a TV. When you reach there, you are in the recording of the event itself. I don't know really how to put this in words, but from my experience, it's almost like when you play a DVD player and you watch a movie. You can hit the pause or you can go fast forward or rewind. So it's like you become the movie and the DVD player both. And through deep concentration and real willpower, you can concentrate on the scene and see people. And you can see them doing things you've never seen happen before. But if you see things you've already know or have seen before, it's most likely an elemental images already in your subconsciousness and not the real cosmic consciousness. But touching the cosmic consciousness, what you see is all new to you. It's like a watching a movie you've never seen before. And if they're talking to each other, do you know what they're saying? Well, if this event is in your country and time period where people are speaking English, yes, you'll be able to understand them. But if you go back in time and they're speaking some ancient language, you cannot really understand what they're saying unless you spoke that language and remember it. But if you really penetrate into the noetical meaning behind the thought form they are creating with their speech, then yes, you can understand them. The cosmic consciousness is just the most perfect, accurate record of anything that has ever happened or existed. But how did it all start? Let's begin with religion's view, which states, let there be light. That's their way of explaining the beginning of everything. What does science say? The current, most accepted cosmological view is that all matter in the universe compressed together into this very, very tiny hot space with unimaginable heat and unimaginable pressure to the point at which it exploded in the so-called hot Big Bang as a burst of firelight that eventually condenses into the matter comprising the entire three-dimensional universe. Both religion and science are speaking about the same thing. Don't you think religions let there be light could be a metaphor for what science is calling the hot Big Bang? What does mysticism say about the creation of the universe? We are talking about the material third dimensional universe and its etheric counterpart. Both matter and its etheric counterpart is part of the third dimension. What mystics see is swirling mass of fire that comes from a higher dimension, precipitates out into the third dimension as it spins and swirls. Now, it's fire and it's spinning, which means it's under the control of the archangel Mahael, the archangel of fire. And the spinning effect is coming from the archangel Raphael. It's a huge, enormous, fiery spear spinning in space. And as it spins, it throws off other fiery balls that are spinning too. And these go off and become the central suns of the galaxy. Likewise, these central suns are also throwing off other rotating fiery balls. 
and these become the suns of all the solar system in any galaxy. Now, science guesstimates that there are maybe a hundred billion galaxies in the entire universe. And in our galaxy alone, there's something like 200 billion of these suns, these solar systems. So now the suns do the same thing. They're spinning in space and they throw off other fiery balls. Due to the laws of physics, the speed of the rotation is faster at the sphere's equator. And so these small fiery spheres, like the central suns of the galaxies, also eject these smaller spheres at the equator. These ones are destined to become all the planets in that sun's solar system. The planets of the solar system are coplanar, which is to say that they are in the same plane with the sun that ejected them. This fact supports what is seen in the Akashic Records. Next, these planetary fiery spheres of light are also spinning very fast, and they throw off other smaller fiery spheres that eventually will become the, a planet's moon. All the spheres are ejected into the absolute zero temperature of space. Absolute zero is minus 273 degrees Celsius, or minus 459 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can imagine these hot, fiery masses spinning in frigid space. Then over great periods of time, they cool down. Then a crust starts to form over the outer surface because of the cold. And again, over great periods of time, the surface of the planet solidifies more and more. But often the crust was opening up and hot magma underneath the surface erupts, letting out steam and gases and lava. It, the steam and gases rise up and start to collect around the newly formed planet. And this creates a primitive atmosphere. This goes on for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of centuries. It's just a vast period of time. And you know, the Bible speaks of six days for the creation of everything. Those days were actually eons. As seen from the records, as the planet that will become the Earth cools down, solidifies, and keeps cracking open over and over, it releases an enormous amount of gases, and all these gases start to form rings of cloud around the Earth. Again, over great periods of time, this process goes on until these rings of clouds are so saturated with water. And, of course, now the clouds are in the space around the Earth, and eventually they release this water as rain. As the water vapor condenses out and rains down on the hot Earth, it creates more steamy water vapors that rise up, again, precipitate out as rain on Earth, again and again, causing more steam to rise from the clouds. And this goes on for eons, creating seven layers of heavily laden clouds. These clouds are so dense that it blocks the sun so much the sunlight can't even penetrate them and reach the earth. The lack of warmth from the sunlight is also cooling down the earth more and more, preparing it for the arrival of mankind. Now we said that everything existing, every piece of matter from an atom to a galaxy has an etheric double. Towards the ends of earth's preparation, the expressions of life come first into this etheric world. These expressions are the plants, the animals, and the human beings, which come from a higher dimension. And now they enter the etheric counterpart of Earth before incarnating in material bodies on Earth. This etheric counterpart is what's been called Eden. Eden was not on the physical planet, but in a pure etheric world. It is a place where the lion lays down with the lamb. There is no killing for food. Killing for food only happens on the material plane. It doesn't happen on the ethereal planes or the higher psychical and noetical worlds, only here. In the higher worlds, everything breathes etheric right from its environment. Everything receives nourishment from the light. So in this etheric paradise garden of Eden, the human beings arrive. And as you probably know from scripture, they were first hermaphrodites. So what the mystics see in the cosmic consciousness follows what religions are saying metaphorically. Then after some time came one of the greatest pinnacles in the journey of mankind, the separation of sexes. And they still lived in peace and plenty there for a long time. Now, if you could see these people there, you'd be surprised. 
First of all, their bodies are not made from gross material, so they're softer. Since they do not need anything to eat to live, they are not actively pursuing interests and would be seen as somewhat apathetic. During this time in the etheric world, the earth is still preparing for the phenomenon of life to appear. When it reaches a point where all the water vapor corrected in the seven rings of clouds reaches full saturation, torrential rains pour forth onto the earth, again for thousands and thousands of centuries. And if you can go out to Utah and see the canyons there, you will see how a lot of water had to be coming down and eroding the rocks over great periods of time to carve all these canyons. After the last cloud releases their water, the earth is now prepared for the arrival of life, and mankind leaves the paradise of Eden and incarnates on the material planet Earth. But in the Bible, it says Adam and Eve fell and were kicked out of this garden paradise by Archangel Michael. Daskalus scoffs at this notion, saying, There was no fall of mankind. It has always been part of the divine plan for man to incarnate on earth. The idea of the fall of man, Daskalus declares, was just a Jewish invention to explain how man came to the planet. In the Old Testament accounts, which comes from the ancient Jewish text, you have Adam, Eve, a tree with an apple and a snake. And the all-knowing God says, don't eat of that tree or you'll die. And of course, Eve goes to the tree and the snake in the tree convinces her that it's okay to eat it and she will definitely not die. And so she eats it, then offers it to man saying, here, you eat it. Man, Adam says, okay, and eats it thoughtlessly. Then the all-knowing God comes, acting surprised that they ate the apple. What have you done, man? Adam blames Eve, saying, it wasn't me, it was Eve that gave it to me. Then God says, Eve, what did you do? And Eve blames the snake. The snake made me do it. Interesting story, but is it true? If you look back at the Sumerian culture, long before the Jewish version, you see the same story. You see the whole scene depicted in Sumerian art. You see the man, woman, naked in the garden, with the tree, the apple, and snake in the tree. The only difference is that in the Sumerian tree is upside down. It has its roots in heaven. So this symbol is so beautiful. The roots of the tree are in heaven, and thus the fruit of the tree represents cosmic energy. And that's what woman is giving to man. It's the opposite meaning of the Jewish story. In the Jewish account, the fall of mankind is the fault of woman. Woman is blamed and becomes the lesser to man. Where in the Sumerian account, it's so beautiful because in that account, Eve is presented as the nourisher of man. Some of those stories in the Jewish text that have become the Old Testament in the Bible seem to be just retold stories from the Sumerian culture. The Sumerians also have a flood story, but instead of Noah, Like in the Jewish version, they have Gilgamesh, and he is warned by God to build a large boat because of great flood that is coming. He too is instructed to save people and male and female versions of each animal. It's the same story. The Sumerians also had Hammurabi, the lawgiver. And like Moses, he goes up the mountain. God gives him laws, the code for mankind, and he comes down. But he comes down with 12 tablets, not two, and gives them to the people. So we see the same stories, but they're kind of retold and reshaped in a different way. So we will leave it here for the human beings for the moment. Now, not only our bodies have the pulse of life in them, the earth itself has such a pulse. And this pulsation of life comes through the etheric counterpart of earth. The pulsation of our heart is an etheric charge that comes from a higher dimension. When it comes through the etheric counterpart of the heart, it makes the heart beat. And so every atom of our body has its own etheric double, and then every cell has its etheric double. Then certain cells form organs, and thus the organs have their own etheric double. Then the entire collection of all these etheric counterparts of the atoms, molecules, cells, all create the entire etheric double of our whole body. And it looks like our whole body. 
Scientists today are looking for something called zero-point energy. This quantum flux, this energy field is everywhere. Einstein's theorized about it. Tesla found it, but was not able to get funding to produce it much. Yet, from his discoveries, he was able to say, in the future, man will connect machines wherever they are to this energy field, which is everywhere. When that happens, we won't need a delivery system to distribute this energy. It will be drawn from the atmosphere. So there's a huge race right now among quantum scientists trying to figure out how to create devices that can do this. They've had one for a long time called the cashmere effect, where they're able to demonstrate that if you put two plates together very, very close and put different kinds of coating on each plate, it produces energy seemingly from nowhere. So they've managed to draw it, but still, it's very, very weak in this device. But that's what they've done so far. Now, the quantum scientists, they know that this exists. And now we have scientists saying what the mystics have been saying for a long time. Another very interesting thing is that the etheric double makes healing possible. The most common reason we get ill has to do with the quantity and quality of energy within our etheric double. This is the driving force of our immune system. So again, the etheric is the exact counterpart, a perfect replica of everything. And of course, what we are teaching here with the practices is how can we connect our own etheric double and use it? And we said, basically, the etheric energy has seven states. We only talk about four right now because the others are too high to even consider. We don't have access to them. But the first one we have access to is the ascetic ether. You'll notice when we say in our meditation, feel your toes, feel your legs, feel your knee. You think you're feeling your body, but it's actually the ascetic ether in the etheric double of your body that you're feeling. Feel your toes when we say that and move up to your knees. You feel the energy moving up your legs. And that's the second nature of the etheric we have access to. The kinetic ether. The word kinetic is from the Greek word kinesis, which means movement. Now, the pulse of life in our bodies, in the planet, in the sap rising, is made possible by the kinetic ether. It's driving all that. The third nature of etheric energy that we have access to is the imprintive ether. When we make a visualization exercise, when we remember something we've seen before, and even when we fantasize, it is the function of the imprintive ether that we are using, but we're using it subconsciously. We need to learn how to use it consciously, because really, it's one of the most important ethers to get the skill of using. That's why we spend so much time developing our latent skills of visualization. The fourth ether is the creative ether, and it's not under our control anymore. It used to be, the Atlanteans had it, even in the Old Testament, you hear about the prophet Elijah raining down fire. That's him using the creative ether to create. And in the Greek stories, there's one where certain people could do this and burn ships up. But this is not the nautical incinerary weapon called Greek fire used by the Byzantium Empire. Some of these ancient adepts still had the ability to use the creative ether, but it was being used to kill their enemies. So God has deprived mankind of the use of the creative ether until we will not use it for bad purposes. Precious few on earth can use it now. That's close good, but he only used it for healing purposes. When we develop ourselves and get mastery over the other three ethers, the creative ether will be restored to us, but not until the powers that be are sure we will not misuse it to harm somebody. Because you can imagine what a dictator or even an egoistic person could do with that kind of creative power. It's bad enough we create destructive elementals and send them to people. Such things are real and can cause real problems. They can even kill people. So our spiritual work is just to train and get used to being able to use the etheric vitality in its three lower states first. 
So the easiest place to do that is to start with our material body. But the etheric energy is in everything existing. Now, the scientists are saying the universe is 14.8 billion years old, and the Earth is 4.55 billion years old. I have the piece of the oldest matter available on Earth. It's 4.55 billion years old. It was left over from the creation of the Earth. Now, let's contemplate this. Just for a moment, consider this 4.5 billion year old matter. It's made of atoms that have nucleus and orbiting electrons. And for 4.55 billion years, the electrons of that material has facedly been moving around the nucleus, never deviating, never weakening, just continuous movement for over 4 billion years. Now, can you imagine anything that's moving like that that doesn't have an energy supply? Of course not. That energy is the etheric vitality at a certain range of frequency. But, of course, if you could research back in time, you would see this etheric energy has always existed since the creation of the third dimension and will be a component of the third dimension always. As an expression, they say that matter in the universe is 14.8 billion years old. It doesn't really matter what age it is. It's just a number at this point because it's unfathomable. They also say there's no such thing as perpetual motion. Ultimately, that may be true, but the electron moving around the nucleus of atoms of the oldest material in the universe for 14.8 billion years, that seems kind of perpetual to me. Our next episode provides a vital understanding of a higher level of reality that surrounds us all the time. In this next installment of our Spiritual Waking presentation, we will again be describing where we are. But this time, we will explore the multidimensional psychonoetical worlds existing at higher rates of vibration than the material world. We will rise above the time-space world of the material plane into what the ancients called the worlds beyond. These are higher dimensions that scientists are now theorizing and calling parallel universes. These worlds are in and around the material universe, but existing at a higher frequency at a higher resonance. We will speak of these multidimensional realities that we all will ultimately pass into upon the death of our material body. We hope you can be with us for this most important episode on spiritual awakening. (laughs) 